Tuesday, October 9th. It is 11.05 a.m. My name is Anthony, and this is the VR Game Rankings YouTube channel. And Tezrim is the first guy to enter the doorway. He is now here, and he is living. And Kev Gret says, if you own a PSVR, this is your day. And boy, is it. Um, you know, PSVR just continues to get a lot of love, a lot of good things happening for PSVR. And it's funny because we have a lot of PC VR players that have picked up PSVRs recently. Gary, of course, you know, he didn't have a PSVR for the longest time. And he probably didn't care that much about a PSVR for the longest time. Um, and me and Steve kept hammering Gary, and he finally succumbed to the pressure. He finally got his hands on a PlayStation VR, and now he knows that he should have probably had a PSVR all this time. It is not the uh, you know it, it's not the, the 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 run of the litter. PSVR is a legit system, and we've seen it with Phil Yarn. And a lot of other people have been grabbing PSVRs recently as well. In fact, Paradise Decay, he just recently picked up a PSVR. Does anybody notice a trend here? So that is Borderlands 2 VR. It is coming on December 14th. And a lot of people will say... It's only single player, man. This is a single player version of the game. There is no co-op. Borderlands is all about the co-op, right? Well, I don't know. For me personally, I can tell you this. I played Borderlands 1 single player style. I didn't end up playing with anybody. Maybe like once or twice I ended up playing with a couple of other people. But I have this thing about getting a game that has a single player mission, right? Okay. And if you want to, you can immediately jump into co-op. You know, for example, like Halo 3. Like you you could get Halo 3, right? And you would get Halo 3 and you could immediately play co-op and go through the entire Halo 3 game, right? Immediately on day 1 co-op style. And some people would go to the store, they'd go buy Halo 3, they bring it home, they get a hold of all their buddies, and like four of them are going through Halo 3 simultaneously, and they're experiencing the campaign mode of Halo 3 as four dudes going through the Halo 3 campaign mode. And the same thing happened with both of the Borderlands games, right? And I don't know, I'm the type of guy, I don't know if anybody else out there is similar to me, where... When I get a game that has this single player campaign, I feel like I feel like I got to go through the entire single player campaign myself, single player style before I do co-op because I just feel like co-op like it ruins it. You know, it ruins the the cinemas it ruins the vibe of the game because you don't know if your friends are going to be trying to be all funny and goofy as you're playing through the game. And sometimes you want to dial into the vibe of the game. And if you're playing co-op and people are talking about, you know, they're yelling at people behind them or they're yelling at their girlfriend to go run, do a Taco Bell run or something or whatever. And you're trying to play the game. You're trying to get into the vibe of the game. So I've always been the type, I want to play single player first play through the entire game single player styly and then get a hold of some buddies and play through it multi you know play through it co-op and then nothing spoiled there's no cinemas that are spoiled for me there's nothing that I miss out of it but the problem with that is I never end up doing that first of all I never end up finishing the initial game itself in the first damn place and so I never end up getting a hold of my buddies and all of us going through it at the same time so it's always this catch-22 for me. But Dr. Freeman says, wait a minute, Borderlands 2 is better in every way. And Crunchy says the second Borderlands is better than the original on many different levels. And, you know, lots of people are saying Borderlands 2 is a lot better. Crunchy says, I also have that exact same OCD kind of situation. And Phil Yarn says, that's exactly why I don't have Winlands 2. Yeah, it is a bit of an issue. And you know when these video game companies like SciTech Games, they come out with Winlands 2, they know about this issue. 
they know that there's a handful of people that no matter how badly they want to play Winlands 2, there's a part of them that says, no, you're going to ruin it for yourself. You got to play Winlands 1 first. They never get around to play Winlands 1, 1 first, and then they never end up with Winlands 2. And so the developer ends up losing out on a good percentage of potential audience for the game just by putting a two in the game or a three in the game and that's why you'll see a lot of developers instead of having a very specific numbered sequel instead they'll have a subtitle and the subtitle like a lot of times people like us with these ocd issues we see that the game has a subtitle and we're like oh this isn't number two this isn't number three okay i can jump in this this is a subtitle it's a side story so i'm all good and then people go into it like that um this is a long time ago this was when the great sea was first announced it was this venture beat article and they had the great sea hands-on adapting a philip k dick short story into vr that is Dean Takahashi. He was the guy that wrote the article there. He's actually a Sacramento native. And Secret Location, this is the developer of Blasters of the Universe. And of course, Philip K. Dick, he wrote the book, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, which was a short story that was then converted into Total Recall. That's the Total Recall. And so here's the great C. We got some screenshots of it. We got some teasers of it. This was in that original original Venture Beat article. And I kind of had my eyes on this for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, so we had a little quote here. This is from, I believe, the CEO, Ryan Andal, president and co-founder of Secret Location. He's talking about how they want to push the medium forward enough so that it can inspire other people to take risks about what is comfortable or not comfortable in VR. And that's, uh, that's a very interesting comment, especially having experience the great sea all the way from the beginning to end and i kind of understand what he's talking about in terms of pushing the medium forward so here is the steam page for the great sea and i was really wondering about the price of this vr experience and the price is six bucks six bucks okay so this is available right now it says october 8th but um, maybe it came out like kind of late last night or something. But um, I didn't think this was available until today. But the price is six bucks. There's only four user reviews. So we don't have a ton of reviews here. And they're basically describing it as a sweeping 30 plus minute experience developed from the ground up to push the boundaries of storytelling in VR and it was an official selection of the Venice Film Festival. And so this is the great C. This is what I'm talking about here. So when we first got our VR headsets, most of us started to wonder, okay, are there gonna be movies in VR? Are there gonna be TV shows in VR? How are they gonna do it? How are they gonna do a movie show? How are they gonna do a movie in VR? How are they gonna do a TV show in VR? Um, how is this gonna work? And the fact of the matter is, these companies don't know no one knows and so it's experimentation and that's what we got with the invisible hours the invisible hours by tequila works published by game trust is probably the best example that we have up to this point in time the best example of how you can legitimately really do like a movie in vr i truly feel that the invisible hours is the first true vr movie that we have now technically speaking it's a vr movie that was created in a game engine and so it's a cartoon and it's running in a game engine and you don't have brad pitt you know you, you don't have aubrey plaza you don't have scarlett johansson you don't have chris pratt you don't have these modern day actors we're not there yet that is probably I don't know, man, that might be like 10, 15 years away before we actually have like live action video type stuff that can be done in VR and made into a movie. No one knows how to do that yet. But what we do know how to do is if you can create a story in a game engine and you can give us a lot of different vantage points, you can create something pretty powerful. And we've seen this with The Invisible Hours. I highly recommend it. I think it's one of the best things we have in VR, period. And now the great C 
is a bit different. It's a little bit different than the Invisible Hours. And, and the main difference here is with the Invisible Hours, I call it uh, location-based storytelling. And I think that is going to be a very big part of VR where you can have multiple stories that are going on simultaneously. Um, kind of like, uh, uh, what's that What's that filmmaker guy? Um, you know, Reservoir Dogs and stuff. You know, where, uh, where they have the story, like all these different stories and they're all kind of going on simultaneously and, and it bounces from story to story. Location-based storytelling where you kind of like move around from one spot to another. That's kind of the way The Invisible Hours was. The Invisible Hours was basically, we're going to make you a ghost and you can view this movie. This movie can happen and you can view it from whatever angle you choose from, but you're not going to have any agency on the story. You're basically just watching it. It's kind of hands off, but you get to watch the story. Now, The Great Sea is different because what The Great Sea does is you have no control over the camera whatsoever. And when you first start up The Great Sea, it gives you two different options on how to watch it. And one of them is a comfort mode, and then one of them is more for VR veterans. And so, of course, I chose the VR veteran mode. And when you click on the VR veteran mode, what it tells you is it's gonna, the camera is gonna be moving around a little bit, so it could be unsettling for VR noobs, basically. But I said, you know what, I'll go ahead and try the VR veteran mode. And so I did that. And so as you're going through the story, what it does is it's switching camera angles. It's zooming in on characters. It's zooming out on characters. It's giving you all these different vantage points. It's giving you a bird's eye view. It's getting really close to where the people are. It's, it's zooming in on their faces. And it's playing out these different stories, but the director, the person that's deciding what kind of angle you're going to get and what you're going to see, the director is still deciding this and has the control over this. And so you're basically being taken on uh, a journey through this story and the camera is controlled. So you have no control over the camera and there's no button pressing or anything. In fact, I think this is something that maybe maybe could be done on the Oculus Go, but but probably not because I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is running in like a game engine. And so that's probably the reason it's not going to maybe work on say like an Oculus Go or something. But if it wasn't running on a game engine, maybe it could work on the Oculus Go. And so you're going through this this story is playing out and it's happening and you're getting all these different camera angles. Now, the thing that you might think initially is if you've ever tried to watch like a 360 video or a 180 video where it's kind of trying to do a story and it's trying and it's switching different camera angles. Has anybody else noticed this, that when you're using live, live video or, or like actual recorded video, and you start switching camera angles, it's very distracting. Like it's kind of like it, it's it's un, it's unsettling because when they switch to different camera angles, it like it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We, you know, we were just on this other camera angle. Now you just switch to this other angle and, it, and it's very, um, it's abrupt and it's kind of harsh and it doesn't work very well. And so one of the things I think that a lot of people have noticed, like Felix and Paul, is if you're gonna be, if you're going to be doing like some kind of video story, you don't want to have quick camera cuts all the time. That shit does not work. However, if you're in a game engine, if you're in a 3D game engine like The Invisible Hours or you're in a game engine like The Great Sea, you can do these quick camera cuts. You can do these dramatic differences in these angles and you can zoom in on people, zoom out on people. And because it's in an actual 3D engine, there's something about it doesn't screw with your brain and it actually works. So I thought this was really good. I liked it a lot. Now we get to the price. So would I pay six bucks for this? Um, well, what I what I will say is I you know six bucks is a hell of a lot better than nine ninety nine, right? It's better than ten bucks. It's better than fifteen bucks. It's better than nineteen bucks. I think I think six bucks is a relatively decent price for this 
because I saw the entire thing and when it was completely over with, you see all the, uh, you see the, the, the credits, you know, the credits roll by and so many different people worked on this. So many different animators, different voice actors, you know, CGI animators, all these different people worked on it and they, we've got to figure out a way to pay for this and people have to support things like this. If you guys want more of this stuff to happen, you really kind of do need to support this. And here I am, okay, I'm on this podium here, and we got this as a free code. You know, VR Roundtable um, were provided a code for this from Secret Location, and we got to check this out. And so we didn't pay for this. And so I'm telling you guys, hey, pay for it, it's six bucks. And I know there's a million games that are out right now, and there's so many great games, and there's a lot of games that are like 12 bucks, 14 bucks. You know, we're just talking about Wipeout VR um, on PlayStation VR is 12 bucks. Well, this is six bucks. That's half of that. Would you be better off taking that other six, adding another six to it, you get Wipeout VR, or do you buy something like The Great Sea? So I know it's kind of an ask to ask people to pay for this. Crunchy says, if the $6 helps them make more experiences, I'm all for it. Well, it absolutely does. If enough of us do it, if enough of us buy it, it does do it. Star Wars Project Porg. The first developer conference for Magic Leap is kicking off in LA today. And the biggest partner to announce a product for Magic Leap 1 Creator Edition so far is ILM X Lab, which has made the experimental Star Wars Project Porg. Porg. More details are expected during Magic Leap's keynote on Wednesday. Okay, so this is something that's coming on Wednesday, and it does say you will need to gain the trust and affection of your Porgs. Oh, so are these things Porgs? These little bird guys? I don't, I don't know what the hell a Porg is. I've never heard of a Porg. Um, you'll need to gain the trust and affection of your Porgs by offering them treats and playing with them. Teach them how to maneuver real-world real, real world environments with care instructions from Star Wars' most meticulous droid, C-3PO. Okay, so it looks like you're taking care of little freaking... It's like a Tamagotchi thing in, in uh, Magic Leap is basically what that sounds like. So that does sound like a bit of a Debbie Downer in terms of... I don't think this is the Star Wars project a lot of people were dreaming about as far as Magic Leap is concerned. But yeah, this is that Project Porg. This is what I'm talking about right here. And we will find out more about this on Wednesday. And so that's the thing. Tomorrow we probably will. Yeah, I've never heard of Porg. See Last Jedi. Okay, I saw The Last Jedi. I, I don't... But see, you know what? The newest Star Wars movies, I gotta admit, guys... The newest Star Wars movies, they're not really doing it for me. In fact, I think I think a lot of the newest Star Wars movies are almost somewhat of an embarrassment. And here's my little rant on these new Star Wars movies. I think they're worrying way too much, way too much about trying to be accurate to the old Star Wars. And I think what they should have done with Star Wars is like, okay, yeah, you've got all this back history... But Star Wars is this gigantic, <laughs> Crunchy says, uh-oh, here we go, here we go. And Dr. Freeman says, look, I 100% agree. He knows where I'm going on this one. And so here's my thought process on the whole Star Wars thing. Like, I don't want to see a Star Wars movie and see a freaking talking lobster in the movie, okay? The calamari or whatever. I do not want to see a talking lobster in the movie, the, the second I see a talking lobster, you've lost me, bro. You've lost me. You've completely lost me as a viewing individual. I basically have tuned the movie out and I'm just, I'm, now it's turned into a comedy. It's turned into a laugh tracks movie for me. That's how I kind of feel about Star Wars. And I hope I'm not really offending some people out there that are like hardcore Star Wars nuts, but they lost me with that stuff. And that basically is going to do it for today. And I will see everybody tomorrow at 11 a.m. Hopefully, 11 a.m. Hopefully, Job, Job, get here a little bit early, Job. Please, spare us, Job. We'd love it a lot if Job got here a little bit early. Yeah, the Discord is coming, guys. The Discord server is coming. All right, then. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take it easy. Later.